Channelfly is one of our adaptive algorithms that we use to uh, optimize the throughput of the wireless system. In particular, Channelfly is working with selecting the, uh, the operating channel of each and every one of our individual access points. And it does that primarily by optimizing throughput. The problem with background scanning is it actually disrupts service. When you go off to do that back, background scan, you have to change the channel. And just the act of changing the channel, it's something that takes um, several milliseconds to do. And then you actually have to go off and, and do that scan. And to get a, enough information, you have to typically dwell on a channel for tens of milliseconds. And during that entire time, uh, before you switch back to your actual service channel, nothing is actually working for your individual clients who you're actually supposed to be serving. Uh, so that, that's one problem. The other problem with background scanning is that you actually don't get the information that you really need. Uh, by background scanning, you're, you're only listening. You're not actually transmitting. And it turns out that you get a lot more information when you go to transmit, uh, when you actually go to use the channel. And so the quality of the information that you're getting is, is very poor with background scanning. Uh, so Channelfly's approach, uh, which, is, which is completely different, is we make uh, throughput assessments when we're actually using the channel that we're using. And then we switch from time to time to different channels to see how they do, and eventually gravitate towards the channel that's actually offering the best uh, throughput, the best performance, the best capacity. It turns out we can actually use the traffic that's already there, the, the normal service traffic, to measure the capacity. And this was actually one of the, the major advancements that we made. Previously, we had to, uh, whenever we were doing wireless testing, we had to go out with, with specialized um, test tools, with test software like, like Zap or Speedflex, these types of tools, uh, to, to measure the capacity. But we found that, that there was actually enough data generated internal to the AP on, on every transmission that we could actually estimate uh, very accurately what that performance would be if you actually went and did a, a speed flex test or, or a zap test. And so that was, that was the key thing, figuring out how to look at what the AP is doing, use the information that's being generated on every transmission to accurately estimate the capacity. And we've found that we can do that to within about a 10%, uh, within about a 10% margin of error. We can tell you what the throughput you're going to get is if you go off and, and do a zap test or, or a speed flex test. It really depends a lot on the environment and how much is going on in the environment. Um, there's differences between 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. But typically, um, it, it's, it's one of these things where uh, you know, initially there's a lot of channel changes as the system is very inquisitive. It's trying to figure out exactly uh, are, are what channels are completely useless, which ones are, are pretty good. Um, and then over time, it'll tend to gravitate towards the ones that are just good. It'll be trying to gather more and more information about the set of channels that is, that is pretty good, trying to differentiate them, trying to differentiate the pretty good one from the, from the really good one. And that process takes time. So I'd say typically after a couple hours, it knows which channels are, are pretty good. And then after uh, several more hours to uh, 24 hours, uh, it, it would know really uh, what channels it expects to be the best. And you, you kind of need that, um, that, longer, that longer time period to really get a, a good sense because most networks have a variation throughout the day of, of, of the usage patterns. And you need to be able to differentiate between uh, the busy times of the day and the not so busy times. And until you've seen a full day's worth of, of pattern, you typically haven't been sort of inoculi inoculated against um, all the different types of interference that you're seeing. One of the interesting things about Channelfly is that this is actually built on the same types of algorithms that we were using in our Beamflex, in the, in the physical layer data rate and antenna selection algorithms that we've been doing for years. Uh, we learned about how to measure the capacity because that's what we're using there to optimize the antenna patterns and the physical layer data, data rates. So it turns out that those same type of metrics, uh, some of the details are, are trade secret, but the same, the, those same types of metrics that we look at, the physical layer data rate, the, the packet error rates, uh, those types of feedback on a per packet basis feeding into a MAC layer throughput model uh, throws off enough information that we can very accurately estimate uh, the channel conditions and the eventual saturation capacity for that user or for the whole radio. Yeah, so that's interesting. So that's kind of folks coming from a radio background. That's their first um, sort of thought. Well, we'll just look at the, the, the signal noise ratio because so much theoretical radio um, design and engineering um, 
centers around this theoretical concept of the signal to noise ratio. But it turns out that that's fine when you're doing mathematical estimates, but uh, the real radios, they don't give very good um, metrics like that. They have a very uh, coarse um, way of measuring signal to noise ratio based on essentially a side effect of the automatic gain control algorithm. These aren't calibrated lab instruments. They're, you know, under $10 Wi-Fi chipsets that uh, squeeze all this cost out. So they, they really aren't calibrated to measure signal strength in any meaningful way. And the other factor is that they all the noise in the environment actually gets thrown into that, that mix. Uh, so they can't give you an actual signal noise ratio. They can give you a um, a signal strength relative to a noise floor, but that actually uh, includes all of the uh, signal not of interest. And if you like, I can show you at the whiteboard sort of uh, what that actually looks like. So this is showing uh, sort of what a chipset sees when uh, it's, it's looking at all the energy in the environment. Um, what you have here is a graph of showing time along the uh, x-axis and, and different signal strengths along the, uh, the y-axis. This, this black line here is the, the noise floor, the noise that's always out in the environment. Uh, the chipset always you know, sees some sort of thermal noise regardless, even in a perfectly clear environment. Uh, the red line here is showing signals not of interest. This could be a neighboring Wi-Fi access point or uh, something along those lines that, that's totally irrelevant to the, uh, the AP that we're talking about. Then all of a sudden a signal of interest comes in, uh, you know, a sharp jump, um, and it lasts for some duration of the packet transmission and then, um, and then drops off. This is what the AP is really interested in, in decoding. But from a receive power standpoint, what this chip actually sees is all of these things added together. And so as you have these other signals from all these remote APs or other sources of interference out there coming and going, that actually gets added in to the signal strength that your AP is actually measuring. And so this whole portion of the signal is, is not of interest, but it still shows up in the RSSI uh, measurement that the, the chipset makes. And so this is why the RSSI measurements are inherently unreliable. So the way that the APs actually change the channel is by use of the, uh, the channel change announcement mechanism that was originally introduced into the 802.11h standard. And the reason 11h introduced it was for DFS regulatory requirements in the 5 gigahertz band. And since pretty much all chipsets support uh, 5 gigahertz at this point, um, at least you know, in some variant of the chipset, uh, th that's built into most of the, the client software. So we're able to reuse that channel change mechanism to essentially move all the clients at once. And th this, um, this uh, change mechanism is actually pretty robust. There's a countdown in the beacon, so even if, if a client misses one of the beacons, it still knows that this countdown is in progress and it knows that it should change. There's some interoperability problems you run into with any clients, just like anything, but in general it's a, it's a reliable uh, mechanism for, uh, for moving all the clients from one channel to another. Uh, in general, there is. Uh, most of the smartphones and tablets that we've seen have uh, very, very good support for 11H. We've seen some problems with some of the uh, uh, more the legacy type of, of laptops, but uh, we think it's something that, uh, you know, going forward, all clients will eventually support. Yeah, so Channelfly has this distributed coordination uh, concept. It's, there's no actual explicit coordination, so it doesn't require a centralized control algorithm of any sort. It's a distributed implicit coordination built into the algorithm, and it uses randomness, actually, uh, to essentially decorrelate the channel changes of the different APs. Just like the 802.11 protocol uses randomness as a way of avoiding collisions between uh, transmissions, uh, we use randomness in Channelfly to avoid having APs uh, synchronized with each other somehow. To keep them desynchronized, there's a very strong random component. And we, we actually borrow some um, techniques from uh, a, a optimization, uh, some optimization called uh, simulated annealing, where you have this uh, concept of the temperature gradually reducing over time. And uh, initially, you have the hot temperature, which causes lots of uh, channel changes. But as you cool this uh, set of APs, as you crystallize them into a, uh, a low energy configuration, you actually reduce the temperature and um, have them crystallize into their operating channels.